begin. Chapter two, this is on the Near East. And if you hear anything fluttering, this is the ancient Near East. This is chapter two in our textbook. Got the fan going. I'm doing this um, lecture PowerPoint in my office at home. And <clears throat> it's really hot in here. So um, it would be a lot noisier if I had the air conditioning on. But here we go. Of course, as I start talking, um, then I get all this scratchiness in my um, um, voice, but so be it. We're going to, this chapter is going to be on Mesopotamia. And um, here we are. Um, this is Turkey up here, Eastern Mediterranean, um, Saudi Arabia, Egypt over here. But um, first we're going to talk about Jericho, which is in this area. And up here for a short trip to Qatar Hayuk and then begin here at Ur um, or the Sumerians. So um, to begin with, um, Jericho. So Jericho is the oldest settlement. Notice um, the dating here, 7000 um, BCE. And it's the oldest known fortified um, settlement. But um, what was found, um, this image is 2-1 in our book, um, are these skulls. And they were buried under the floor. And you will learn too at Katal Huyuk, they did the same thing where they buried their dead underneath the floor. Um, but here they saved um, the skulls. So what they would do is you, they would have to be clean completely inside, outside. And once that has been achieved, then they use plaster, then they use their hands, and they actual, uh, actually, I'm uh, moving my hands around, they model the actual features. Um, they're rubbing this plaster all over um, the skull, and at the same time, they're modeling the features of the deceased. In these cowrie shells, um, I think most people have seen them, were used as eyes. So it says here, skulls such as this reflect an attempt to reconstitute the image of the dead person, modeling the features in plaster, just as I've said, but also the hair was painted. Um, and, you know, again, the cowrie shells were embedded in the eye sockets. Here's a, a different version of it. The dead were buried under the floors and the skulls were kept above the ground here at um, Jericho. So we have not talked um, about the dead um, or, or the rituals or the practices of, we have seen it in chapter one with the dolmens, um, two upright, very large uh, megalithic stones covered by um, one um, probably larger that is fitted on top. Um, and people were buried inside these dolmens. And of course, the um, cremated remains um, have been found at uh, Stonehenge. So, but here we have this practice going on at Jericho and the same thing um, you will find um, in a different region in Turkey. They do the same thing at Katal Huyuk. So this is just one image of the um, wall, um, but let me take you to the tell because this is the tell at Jericho. And the tell is a mound, and that's what we're looking at here, obviously an aerial view, and it's quite large, and around this um, was built a wall, um, what's called a fortification. And there had to have been a reason um, at this point in 7000 BCE where they would go to such um, extremes um, to, to build um, the wall, which happens to be, I think it's um, it says, says here that they are five to 12 feet thick, these walls. And um, the tower, which um, I think this is, um, is 30 feet high. So um, this up here is a way to enter into, um, into the tower. But at the same time, you're looking at how this was constructed. So they've used stone. And if they dressed it, which means that they might take some kind of a tool and cut at the stone um, to get a better fit, so be it. Um, it looks like it's also mixed with rubble, but um, um, at this point, um, you know, being um, as it's 7,000 um, BCE, 
um, it, you know, it could be looking at crumbled rock. This image, excuse me, here of Kathleen Kenyon, Kenyon, excuse me, um, she did a lot of work here at uh, Jericho and she has written quite a bit about it and what is commendable about this woman that's who you're looking at here she definitely looks like the authoritarian um, figure um, who knows who she's talking to um, somebody else probably this image is from one of her books but the, the um, I bring her up because her work is admired um, 1960s um, as far as how she recovered materials um, from Jericho and how she treated the materials, which was very carefully and being very careful um, about um, writing down exactly what she found, um, the date, and um, at this point, um, too, she would be photographing um, her finds as well. And um, so a mound, what creates um, this mound? And um, typically, um, other settlements that were here before um, Jericho um, and, and after, um, buildings crumble down, buildings get torn down, and they're not hauled off um, to um, you know, some junkyard. They're left right there and pressed into the soil, um, what um, is you know, taken down and um, because it's described here as people living um, in houses that are made out of mud brick. Um, they're plastered. Um, the floors are plastered. The walls are plastered. And so the materials are, are organic, but they're also said to be um, standing on stone foundations. And I'm assuming um, that they're talking about the very materials um, are thought of as organic and therefore the stone foundations. Just a moment here. Before we leave, I want to show you this, um, and this is from Jordan. So um, if Jericho, um, Jericho would be to the west of um, Jordan, Jordan, of course, is um, a large country in the Middle East today, but this wonderful sculpture was found, um, and the dating on this one is 6500 BCE, gives you the actual location, but um, this is not made with stone, um, it's made with reeds, and that's what you can see um, that is visible beneath the plaster that has worn away. These reeds, um, I think of reeds because um, of like where we live, we have the delta um, nearby and reeds could be collected in our delta. Um, something like this could be recreated. The reeds were probably dried, they were tied in bundles to create um, these actual forms here. So this is quite amazing. Um, and given that it's not rock, um, it's not, not a rock sculpture. Um, these are the early beginnings of um, sculpture making. So the eyes up here, this looks like black makeup here around uh, the pupils of the eyes. And what's used is bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-E-N, I believe. And it is a resource that is natural in this area. It is something um, um, that can be recovered or taken from the ground. It's, uh, it's uh, large rocks of bitumen and in the hot sun, it's gooey um, like asphalt and they use it, um, they, they have been found to use it like the in-between, like it, when you're stacking mud bricks, then you do a layer of bitumen and you put another mud brick on top of it. Yes, so. The end of Jericho. The reason that Katal Hoyuk, um, which is in Turkey, and I had pointed that out um, when I began this lecture, and it's in Western Turkey, it's, it's called Anatolia, and it's a, actually it's a very famous area of Turkey where rugs um, and carpets were produced, but I'm gonna say rugs. But in any case, um, this is um, one of the most um, it famous for being one of the most developed areas, uh, developed settlements in, in the ancient world. 
And um, the author points to um, that their, their trade was well developed, therefore their agriculture um, was well developed. Um, but she also refers to it as the pre-literate uh, period, meaning we don't have anything, um, it, there hasn't been anything established that was written down um, as of yet um, too early. So it's referred to as the pre-literate um, period. So they lived in, lived in houses, um, excuse me, I'll go back here where they were connected. And uh, there's the first floor, um, but it seems like socially um, the second floor, whoops, um, pardon me, up here um, was, um, people look busy down here as well. This, this looks to be a rather large um, home um, that you've got one room, you've got another room, um, and this looks to be a bull's head here. But anyways, up here, activities going on up here, everyday activities, and down here as well. Um, but they found ladders leading up to the top floors and have thought it to be um, that just the style of this settlement where there are no streets, houses are connected together to get from um, one, um, one area to another. Um, you walk across the roofs. Um, can't comment any further um, than that. I think you would want to be rather friendly with your um, neighbors, but it could have been a defense mechanism as well. From up on the second story, you could see around you, um, and there are different levels um, at Katal Huyuk, meaning there are higher uh, roofs um, than others. But in any case, you could see around you as far as any approaching um, enemy. So um, they domesticated animals um, here, and um, they have found um, that they too buried their dead um, under the floors of their homes. Um, and um, as, as far as religious um, practice, um, pra um, practices there, um, the author is cautious um, about um, how um, she uh, defines um, whether there may um, just, you know, just the language being used as far as rituals that were performed because they could tell from one room to another or one house from another, so to speak. Um, if it's a, you know, if it's a family living in a home and leaving debris um, behind, those are, um, that is an identifying factor. Um, as to the garbage um, that was actually found at the site, as opposed to a room where um, they have found um, the heads of bulls um, or possibly the, um, the practice of, of uh, rituals um, involving um, uh, bulls. But then they have paintings as well um, here. Um, we have this one here, and this is a wall painting, and it actually is of Katal um, Hoyuk here of the of the settlement and we're looking at um, what looks to be a volcano it's a view of a town and volcano and is assumed that this um, refers to Katal Hoyuk. Um, notice that it is defined as shrine number seven um, and um, could be room 14 and this is probably how it was in and this is um, from a different lecture so ignore the 1-20, and I think this was um, um, as far as uh, the person who was working there, or the team that was working there, um, this is how this room was um, defined. But it's pretty wonderful. Um, and this is called fresco painting, as this one would be too. Here, this is a different um, fresco painting, different wall painting. We have these rather large deer in comparison to the humans. And it says um, men taunting a deer. And um, one could, um, I, I suppose, um, point at this as some kind of method um, of um, you know, preparation. Um, before killing the deer or um, activity involved. Looks like there's more humans than there are deer in this image. Um, but in any case, this is a Katal Hoyuk. Also, we have this um, sculpture here and it's called the Anatolian goddess giving birth. Um, and that's actually what's um, happening here. And um, in this one, um, so this would be, 
um, this this um, is the actual caption um, from our textbook here. And Adams um, suggests that um, it's reminiscent of the Venus of Villendor from um, chapter one. Why? Um, probably because of the exaggerated um, female features of this goddess, the breast, the tummy, um, the enormous legs, the birth of the, um, you know, of, of her um, hips, meaning the wide hips. And um, most unusual is the little, um, the child um, that she has just given birth to. She's sitting on some kind of a, dare I say, throne. Um, and you have these uh, feline heads here in addition. Okay, so this is Katal Huyuk, um, one of the most developed settlements at this time. So um, back to the map of Mesopotamia, and um, we're going to um, begin in this area here. Um, notice um, this arc here, oops, and is called um, the Fertile Crescent, which involves, uh, travels all the way this way. Um, as far as trade routes, um, which may have at this time definitely would have been coming um, from the east and traveling actually in the form of this, um, following the form of the ark um, and as far into Egypt um, as um, they could uh, travel safely. But in any case, um, um, what first had to be done, in my opinion, is, is controlling the flow of water um, because this, this is a very fertile um, delta here um, and the soil is clay and they built their homes with mud bricks and they either sun dried them or eventually used kilns, kilns, K-I-L-N-S. And they would have had to come up with um, flood control measures um, they had to invent. In other words, there were no blueprints for this one. Um, and uh, built canals and, and more. So um, what would follow is, is a controlled system of agriculture. So we're talking about the sixth or the fifth millennium agriculture developed in this rich soil and our soil here in the Delta is also referred to as alluvial. And the Tigris and Euphrates, it means the land, or Mesopotamia means the land between these two rivers. Water control measures, yes. Between 4,000 and 3,000, major cultural shift. Um, and it is, it's huge, um, um, this changeover from hunter-gatherer, which um, took um, millennia um, to happen and to get to this point. Um, a key thing about how Mesopotamia um, develops is they, um, they call themselves city-states and cities is, is like a, a big word um, because um, in the beginning it would have been towns which needed to be administrated and as, as they grow they become cities um, and um, each one has its own god, gods, um, God and gods in government. Social hierarchies, you're either the ruler or a priest or you are a worker. What did develop is specialized skills as these cities grew, which makes sense. Um, for agricultural needs, there would be, um, you know, the, uh, the ability um, or the mechanisms for milling grains, oven building for cooking and pottery, kilns made um, for bricks, textile weaving, definitely metal making. Surplus products of these skills led to increased trade and increased travel to other regions and increased contact with other cultures. It does seem like a big jump to be talking about organized religion, but it did become an organized religion. And it did play an important role in Mesopotamian culture. Um, priests are under rulers. Their duties included controlling the rituals and the sacred sites, which are the temples. And the people of the ancient Near East worshiped numerous gods and goddesses. And every city had its special protective deity. Um, and when we get to the Neo-Babylonian period, um, there's so many gates around um, um, the city and each one has its own um, god or goddess. 
<clears throat> that the um, gate, the entrance is dedicated to. Anyways, typical large architectural complexes in city states included clusters of both religious, administrative, and service buildings developed in each city as centers of ritual and worship and also of government. So um, eventually, um, Sumer um, will be um, overtaken um, by the Akkadians. And um, what causes that? So no surprise, man's desire for wealth and agricultural resources and lack of natural defenses um, for Sumer. So um, you have to match um, your enemies. Sumerians controlled the south, Sumerians eclipsed by the Akkadians, that's their northern neighbors. The Akkadians will um, be overtaken, will be eclipsed by their northern neighbors. Then Sumer will regain power locally. The city-states at Ur and Lagash thrived under strong leaders. The Amorites were next to dominate the south, forming a new society under the leadership of Hammurabi, with its capital in the city of Babylon. So, excuse me, oops. Well, um, it, it bought back to the map, so why not take the uh, opportunity? Um, this is where Mesopotamia begins um, in the, you know, the lower area. And it develops in this direction. So um, this is, here are the Akkadians up in here. Um, Babylon um, eventually um, develops in this area here. So um, they have their own language. Um, and so language um, uh, becomes critical um, as, as far as takeovers. But in any case, um, instead of from the top down, it's from um, the bottom and activity um, beginning in an upward um, direction. And I'm trying to do this. So what we see happening here in Mesopotamia is the formation of a civilization. If we were in the classroom, I'd be asking you um, this, this question. I mean, um, we are a civilization ourselves. What do we have? We have langu language, we have religion. Um, we have military, we have education, and if I already said religion, forgive me, um, and on and on. So the origins of writing um, is, is an important development here. In our textbook, um, the author Laurie Adams talks about pre-literate um, as opposed to literate, and, and the gain um, to the point of literate uh, means when they actually start um, writing um, down um, stories, um, actually. And that would be Gilgamesh is one. Um, but initially, uh, they use um, cuneiform, which is, um, is, yes, they begin with cuneiform, they begin with pictographs. Let's see if I get this is a better slide in here. Pictographs um, on this side here, very simple images that develops into actually these wonderful abstract um, forms here. But um, initially they needed a way to administrate their wealth. And um, so therefore um, who is learning how to write would begin with the ruler and, the, and those people um, who are um, inv involved in the administration. And if I was delivering something to the temple myself, so many sheep and, and what have you um, for my taxes, I'm surely paying attention um, to how things are um, being um, written down um, and would learn quickly about numbers. So this is a stylus. This is what they actually use. They did not write on paper. They wrote on clay tablets. So the clay um, tablet would have to be a bit soft um, to do um, to to write with such a tool. And this is actually a reed um, that they have formed the stylus with. And this is just showing you this. Ooh, I'm not sure that I can show you that one. Okay, um, mud brick um, kasbahs. Um, so we're in um, Morocco. I think I probably threw this in here because this is a current image. And um, this spot here, still using um, mud bricks. And I think the next is example, um, you're gonna see um, bricks here. Now they had to have used a cast. 
um, some kind of a cast um, for the bricks so that they could do it, um, you know, make bricks um, quickly. This area of our um, uh, textbook is sort of warming um, us all up to uh, temple architecture. And um, these look quite small, but these are cones. This is a cone mosaic. So um, a, this, each one of these is cone shaped. Just think of an ice cream cone. And you can see it in, in our um, textbook on page um, 53. And they were colored just as you see them in figure 2-4. So they're, um, they're actually painting them and especially on the round flat end. So the column itself is, um, I, um, I, I've always thought um, that uh, the architecture that we're looking at here is uh, being built with mud bricks um, because we're coming up to the White Temple and that's what they use um, to build um, that building. So the column itself um, um, has to have some kind of wet material, plaster, clay, um, it, it has to be wet itself to insert these cones. And let's see what this one is here. Um, this is a better one. I'm, um, this uh, reminds me of weaving patterns. Um, these, um, uh, especially um, this design here, um, it probably originated um, or originally with uh, basketry. This is what you call a twill um, design here. Two color, twill design. Um, and this is actually how they found columns. Um, and you're looking at the remains um, of what was found. This is the actual column here, and these are the cones. And these columns are huge. Um, I know um, it, it's a, a little hard to de um, discern that um, from these images um, here, but um, they were. And that they would go to this extreme um, because this is something that they would use at the temple. And um, when we um, get to that point, um, I will point um, I will point that out to you. This is just a chart of of Mesopotamian um, gods, and the first one is the one that. Um, we're going to, or it will be mentioned for the temple that is first looked at. It's the chief deity of the Sumerians. It's the god of the sky and the city of Uruk. And I just want to say at the beginning, in the formation um, or the development of their gods, um, I refer to them as elemental, meaning having to do with, um, I, I think that um, um, Laurie calls them um, like agricultural, um, she speaks about agricultural rituals. Um, it's, um, it, they're, you know, as far as agriculture, their needs are elemental, um, meaning water and sunshine and, and, you know, the weather conditions. And so their gods, um, if you read over here, um, or read in here like Enlil, a new son, Lord of the Winds, Lord of the Earth. He eventually replaced his father as King of the Gods. We have gods of water, arts, and crafts, and wisdom. And of course, there's going to be love and war. Um, but initially, it had to do um, with birth, death, rebirth. Um, and they're referred to as agricultural rituals. The influence of um, what you, um, what we all know of uh, plant life. You plant the seed, um, it blossoms, um, it, it turns into, um, you know, it grows into the plant that it does and eventually dies. And um, this is one um, that parallels, uh, coordinates with their actual um, religious beliefs. Okay, so you can read over this one um, about um, their religion, polytheistic, meaning they have many, many gods. Um, uh oh, that is people believed in many deities. These gods were represented anthrop uh, anthropomorphically, human in form and character, but were superhuman in power and immortal. You may read over this. So um, the Uric, um period. I'm going to pause here for a moment. Okay, wanted to um, travel back to the map and show you where Uruk is. Okay. I really like that Laurie Adams puts this um, 
this face. I've always used it in my lectures um, using other books. And I just think it's a smart selection because it's possible that the female shown right here might be Inanna. Um, and what we have here are scenes of agriculture um, and honoring the goddess Inanna discovered within the Inanna temple complex at Yurik, the first great work of visual narrative relief sculpture. So um, if on a test, say, um, for example, you were um, to, um, you had to speak about this uh, vase here, it, it's actually meant to be read from the uh, bottom to the top. Um, this is Inanna here in a particular outfit. It looks like we see her in pri um, profile. Um, yes, but in any case, down here, it starts with the very goods that are being brought up to her to the temple. So these wavy lines here represent ground and water. And what's growing here is barley. It's natural to the area. How wonderful is that? Um, I don't know if any of you have ever eaten barley. Um, it's For me, it's like typical for something that gets put in soup. Um, but in any case, um, they also had date palms um, in Mesopotamia too. So um, what we see here is this growth, this agriculture, and the next register, these are registers, register one, two, three, um, and I'm gonna go up here, four and five. We have these empty spaces um, between um, two and three. So um, this is um, stock um, animals um, that are being brought up to the temple as well. We have nude men with baskets of food uh, that are being carried up to the temple. And here you can see food being delivered. Now these odd things right here are palms. And in um, their beliefs, uh, the palms are sacred. And I just wanna say, um, all of us living in this area, certainly you have seen really tall palms and so tall um, that they are as, I've, I've seen them there as much as 40 feet high, which um, will parallel with the White Temple, um, whose uh, platform actually is that high. But isn't this thing wonderful? It's alabaster, um, and this is relief sculpture. Alabaster is an actual stone and it's a process of subtraction again here, stone removed to create these relief sculptures. This is not done in high relief, but it is a complex narrative. So they may have been, the Sumerians may have been the first to use pictures to tell stories um, coherently, um, read over this in here, it just repeats um, what I just explained to you. And um, here, I threw this in here because um, somebody's thrown a better light on this and you can see it um, more um, clearly. This is what um, uh, I just talked about and this is the opposite side. And uh, um, you're getting plenty um, to look at. This is even clearer. It's black and white, you never know. All right, and I threw this one in here um, because this would be a fun one. Um, th these are actually overlapping um, palm trees um, in here. And this um, too, um, these like this, okay, these are palm trees is what I mean to say. Um, this looks like ground and um, you have these different registers um, in this elegant um, vase here and one that is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. All right, um, bringing us to image 2-7. This is a female head. Um, again, we're in Uric. And here's another um, shot of her looking more like, um, who knows why the stone is the color that it is, um, but it's flattened in the back. Um, so it's, I don't think it was meant to be seen. And up here, this um, cavity here, so to speak, um, is where um, something that is arranged as hair, because um, it says here, we got colored materials, lapis lazuli, copper and gold, et cetera. Yes, it could have been um, attached to a wooden head. In any case, there was a wig. 
um, and it would have been um, right at the very top. Um, there's this, what you see in opening, but there's also a hole there where it could have been plugged and then the hair would fall about the sculpture. So this is very sophisticated. Let's get the dating on this one, 3,500 to 3,000. This is one of those objects that was stolen um, when the Iraq Museum was vandalized, and that was during the Iraq um, War. Um, but during all that confusion and people knew um, those, um, the thieves, so to speak, knew um, that anything taken from this um, museum, because this is really the belly of um, human civilization, uh, much of the work that um, is, uh, is, um, was in the museum. Um, so it was recovered, oops, um, and it's called um, is it Inanna, um, September 24, 2003, one of Iraq's most treasured antiquities had been returned to the Baghdad Museum since it was looted during the war. 5,000 years old war um, mask, also known as the Sumerian Mona Lisa, was recovered by Iraqi police and U.S. soldiers in an orchard after a tip-off. 13,000 pieces are still to be found. So this was as of 2003. Um, and um, that, uh, you know, the refinding or the recovering of um, all these objects is in and of itself um, an interesting history. So um, still to be found, 32 of them, a great value out of 15,000 pieces stolen from the collection of 170,000 artifacts. Okay, so this is a, a little bit um, difficult um, to talk about because what um, what you see here, um, the next um, the the next slide that you're going to see is the Anu Ziggurat and Temple, and it's called the White Temple um, because it was whitewashed, um, literally. And I put this here, linking heaven and earth. This is um, a belief of theirs that what temples actually um, do. So you can read over this. It introduces two, um, actually, uh, uh, two temples. Um, one that will, uh, right now, the White Temple um, will be discussed, and then um, the Nanna Ziggurat um, will get um, discussed later. So why is it called the White Temple, whitewashed mud brick temple that modern archaeologists refer to as the White Temple was erected on the platform, which is called the Ziggurat. This now ruined structure was a simple rectangle with an off-center doorway that led into a large chamber, the cella. So you've got a few things um, here. Number one, you need to understand it's a mud brick temple, which blows me away because it's quite, quite high. Um, and um, that platform, um, it's, the temple is actually built on top of a platform of solid mud brick. And also the cella, C-E-L-L-A, not the cella, um, C-E-L-L-A-R in a home. This is different. Um, um, when we get to Greece, um, uh, you'll run across this term again. It's, it's a place um, for the white temple where rituals take place. So statues of gods and donors were placed in Sumerian um, temples. So this is the remains. Um, stone and polished brick um, talks about the ziggurat. Let's take a look um, here. Um, so the ziggurat, um, the Sumerians invented this. Um, uh, its most impressive surviving archaeological remains are ziggurats, huge stepped structures with a temple or shrine on top. The first ziggurats may have developed from the practice of repeated rebuilding at a sacred site with rubble from one structure serving as the foundation for the next. Elevating the buildings also um, protected the shrines um, from flooding. Um, and mind you, this is, um, this is built on the, um, the Mesopotamian floor, so to speak. And it makes good sense that it would be an elevated um, platform. So here we have this again where um, repeated building on top of um, 
you know, structures that have fallen down or been torn down, and um, um, what the debris that's left becomes the very foundation. And um, read over this. It talks about um, ziggurats towering over the flat plain. Imagine being one of the first people ever to see um, the temple once it was built. And what does it symbolize? It definitely symbolizes the wealth of the ruler, the prestige, the stability of the city's rulers, and four, um, most important, it glorified the gods. Um, but it also glorifies um, or honors, um, I would say glorifies um, the skill of actually building um, one of these temples. So I just want to see which wonderful picture I have in here. So this is, is um, this I have to work with here. Um, this is the temple up here and these are the walls the actual um, sides um, here of the temple. And I, I believe um, this talks about the, the numbers um, refer to, um, that I think you have to um, go, well, if I count backwards, um, then there's four that's up here. And you actually um, approach the temple in a counterclockwise way, meaning you go up a set of stairs, you get onto the top part of the ziggurat, which is 40 feet high. So that zone up there, that's peanuts to us. Um, I'm, the room I'm in, um, the ceilings are eight feet high. So by, um, multiply that by five, and you know we have apartment buildings that high. Um, to the Sumerians, that zone up there, um, 40 feet high, is, um, is, is, is the right place um, to perform rituals inside of the temple. Um, it's uh, like sharing the zone of um, where the gods travel. Okay. This is Khan Academy, and I'm taking you here. It's available for everybody. Um, so I feel comfortable showing you this. Um, and um, I'd forgotten that I had pulled this up. So you can see um, the actual sides um, of um, the ziggurat. And this is the temple proper that they built on top. And imagine the labor to do this um, over and over again in the ancient world. Um, um, you'll hear me say, and you can see these teeny people down here, but just the effort to do this and this relationship um, that um, like civilizations or, or um, in, in this area that people have, rulers have, um, the community, the cities have with their gods that they go to this much trouble um, to build um, these temples. Now this is not an area that myself, that an ordinary person would go up to. This is where the priests work and definitely where the ruler would go. And that there is such an emphasis um, um, instead of um, like just a straight shot up to the temple, um, it's, it's uh, almost like a procession um, to get into the temple if there was some festival, some, some um, celebration that one could observe those who are deserving um, to actually use this area, um, one could watch um, the approach, the procession that, um, that ends up at the temple. Okay. The next topic that I'm gonna talk about are these cylinders. And these were actually used, this is not in the book, um, could not find that one, but this is a good picture, a good slide of a cylinder. Notice that it's round, which it is. Um, and this image here actually unrolls, um, or um, what we see here is actually inscribed um, on, um, this one is made of, what is this one made of, yada, yada, yada. This is lapis lazuli, and this is um, from the tomb of Queen Pu'abi. They actually found it. Um, I think are on her wrist or near her wrist um, in the tomb. And I'll talk about that in uh, just a moment. So it's a two register scene 
Um, and what is used, like I had said, um, I hope I had mentioned before, um, no paper, they're using clay tablets. They're using wet clay um, if they're writing, and um, this would be used as a signature on something. So um, this, um, it, this gets sculpted um, with, and it's very small. Um, you can see here, it's um, about an inch and a half. So something, the tools are really, the chisels are very small. And again, it's a process of subtraction um, to actually um, create um, the scene here. And you ready your clay tablet, and then you roll um, the cylinder um, across uh, the wet clay. So um, originally they were used for administrative um, purposes. And this um, just describes um, the actual um, cylinder. Okay, in our textbook, uh, there is, um, there's a section, uh, rightfully so, and it's called From Pictures to Words. And the actual um, seal that's in, in the book, and I am turning my pages here, right? Um, it's a clay tablet with the pictograph text that preceded cuneiform. Okay, um, so I couldn't find um, that one, but um, I could find this one here um, that has pictographs um, on it. Um, the one that's, uh, the one that um, Laurie Adams has used is, is a, it's a, it's a really good example. It, it's like one, two, three, four, five registers of pictographs in it. Um, but I love her use of pre-literate, which, um, which then begs this story here on Gilgamesh. And I do know professors uh, that actually use um, the epic of Gil um, Gilgamesh. Um, and it is a heroic um, epic at that um, for um, his or her students to read during the semester. So um, what is included in this text um, is it, it, um, it says that, let me see, Gilgamesh finally attain, uh, attains immortality as the builder of Yurik's um, walls. But um, he reminds me of any hero um, I think of Hercules and, and um, the the um, um, the twelve trials that he had to go through. Um, you know, he has a mortal mother and a god for a father, and so to to prove himself, he you know he has to go through these horrible um, um, trials. Um, but Gilgamesh is um, actually he he is he seems to me. Um, he, he seems like a model. I mean, he would be fun in a class, uh, one, to read the epic, but also to compare him um, to modern day, um, because in, in the end, um, the things that um, uh, he questions about himself, given what he has to go through, it's a, it's a good story. Do read um, what is in the textbook on page 57, um, and it is under the heading of literature. So th there is this changeover, there is this need um, to express in words as opposed to pictographs um, what is going on in Mesopotamia uh, or to record those stories that have significant um, religious um, import as well too. Now these figures here are just straight up fun. Um, these are statues from the Abu Temple at Tel Esmar in Iraq. And do read over um, pages uh, 58 through um, 59 about this location. Um, but it brings up the topic of how, um, I mean, one might say even priests um, imagine um, the experience of the God actually entering the temples that they build. So. Um, this has nothing to do with the elite. Now, you could hire somebody or commission someone to please make you one of these um, statues, um, one of these representations, um, which would be of yourself, and there would be some good wishes um, as well um, that would be um, um, uh, partnered with this or associated um, with this, but these would be put in the temple. And it says here, 
Um, they're called statuettes. They have been found at other temple sites um, besides um, this one here. And um, this is this is the one um, I, I couldn't like figure 213 isolates just this figure's head um, to speak about it. But um, there's consistency in the style um, of these images. Of course, people don't look like this, but this is where they're at um, with stone um, sculpture. But uh, the important thing is check out the hands um, because notice everybody has their hands folded and folded in the same place um, near, um, near their breasts, but notice the eyes as well. Um, it's, it's as if you are in the presence of the God and um, you, um, you would be awe struck if, if, um, you know, if it actually occurred. So all of these, um, the women, um, wear pretty much, um, the same outfits. They have these, uh, um, these, uh, this particular skirt here, um, you are a gal, aren't you? I believe you are. And the men um, are nude from the waist up, um, but they have this flounced uh, um, skirt um, as well. The feet seem to be dis, um, um, consistent. Um, and and they are described in, in the text as cylindrical. And that is emphasized by these round platforms that they stand on. It just makes um, good sense that that is the sturdiest um, uh, you know, finish uh, to a sculpture that you could have for all these um, statues that get placed um, in the uh, the temple uh, proper. But at the same time, it, it's it's an indicator of how this sculpture began, which would have been in a list, um, cylindrical form that was cut down or or um, and thus formed these um, images. In other words. Um, this denotes the process of how it was actually made. In here, um, you really, um, <laughs> you, you do see um, um, very clearly how, how the eyes um, are defined. And let's see, I think, I, I think that's lapis lazuli um, that is used um, for the eyes um, in these. Just a moment. It can be different in different books, um, but um, according to um, Laurie Adams, the figures are made of pale stone. We get it. Um, you can see there's some fluctuation of color here. Their hair, beards, and other features emphasize with black pitch. Let's go back here. Do I see any black pitch? Probably um, in here. And, but we'll just, oops, um, excuse me. And, in here, let's just go with it. Um, black pitch, beards, uh, the eyes are shells, and the pupils are inlaid with black limestone. So that's quite an investment um, for a sculpture at this time. And um, do read how she describes these. Now, these are stylized um, images. And what would, um, like the, um, what would be stylized, say, for the beers, right? Um, that would be an unusual beard unless you dipped it in starch and you actually cut it um, to get this. But this is, um, the hair is definitely um, stylized um, here. So the hair and the beard and, um, but what she emphasizes here is the realism um, of the cheek area. Let's see if we can get it in here. Not exactly, this is a better one. Um, here, so it goes from stylized hair and kind of crazy eyes here, but um, something um, truthful or realistic being attempted um, for the rest of the face. I think the form here, the drop from the neck and the shoulders here. This is the; these are soft lines um, that are that are used um, for the female um, figure. One last thing about these gorgeous creatures um, here. Uh, the, um, the temples, the cella, um, are referred to in other textbooks as waiting rooms. Like, um, and the precision um, 
the actual design of temples and, and the cella are, are configured in their minds and in, in the Sumerian mind um, as being um, correct as far as, as a place um, that priests and the ruler, you know, wait, um, are awaiting um, for the gods to appear. So this idea that the gods are up here, like above us, um, originates here. And um, certainly, um, I would say Christian religions think of heaven as, as a place up there. And certainly when we get to the chapters on Gothic architecture, um, they, um, they, they're, uh, the interior of these cathedrals are so high. Um, and the idea is to create a heavenly um, space inside these fantastic cathedrals. So this idea of, um, of like um, starts here, I'm emphasizing here that um, a lot of effort was put into building the platform, building the temples and, and creating um, um, the cella, the the waiting room, um, so to speak, it, it's not unlike um, what continues um, many um, millennia um, later, but it begins right here. This image is from Ur, and this image um, is also from the Tomb of Queen uh, Puabi. And this is the sound box. And I hope, yes, I've got the correct number here, 214A. And this is um, reconstructed because it was found, uh, the actual box was uh, broken and what, um, when, they, when it got dug up, when it was discovered. So all of this is new. Um, also, um, the gold plating um, has been uh, replaced too on, on the bull's head. Um, this panel here in the front is intact. This is a leer. And here, in this little teeny um, um, image over here, you can actually see um, the leer. You can actually see its recreation, its actual um, creation um, that is recreated um, here. So no kidding. Um, this, just a moment. Okay. Um, so this jumps right into 214B, um, why not? Um, and talking about um, Scorpion Man, who appears in the bottom scene on the front of the box, maybe one of the fearsome guardians of the sun, described in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, yes, there are fearsome guardians, um, and there are others, um, of course, that make that story so rich. Um, in addition to hybrid forms, um, and there's a term that you absolutely need to know, hybrid, it means it's, it's a combination of something here, combining animals with other animals and animals with humans, because you see like this scorpion um, standing like a human male figure um, with the head of a male figure. These figures could represent either mythological creatures or people dressed as animals. And I believe in um, Gilgamesh or other, um, other um, like other literature that has to do with um, funerary practices or, or speaking of the underworld. Um, such animals are mentioned and even in songs um, that would be performed um, at, uh, for funerary rituals. They, they speak of these hybrid animals. So in another textbook, um, you would, what I've just described here, um, you'll see that written, um, and trying to make sense of what is in this beautiful, um, uh, panel here. It's an inlay panel from the front of a sound box. So this is some kind of stone here, and, um, I'm going to, in, in a, uh, following slide explain to you what inlay actually is. This is quite good um, in here. Um, the images are um, in uh, perfect detail. That's what I mean. What we're going to look at, um, pieces have fallen away. Tesserae is being used, which is a kind of glass. Um, actually here it would be stone. So um, this is the best I could um, get for something legally to show in a um, online video. 
of the restored Sumerian lyre. Black and white, not too bad. Um, and in the next one, um, oh, it talks about, I'm introducing you, um, and it's surprising that um, Adams um, doesn't get into it. Um, I'm going to go back here as far as um, the grave site, which is just uh, fascinating, um, actually. And the 215, um, I say here, similar to, you're going to see this. If I couldn't get the exact image, then I say similar to. And you can look at it. It is a fun instrument in the book, figure 2-15, and that's on page um, 61. It's... Um, quite wonderful and it would be even more wonderful if we could hear it um, played. So this is the Royal Cemetery at Ur. So nothing emerged from the Mesopotamian soil attracted as much attention as the treasures that Leonard Woolley discovered in the um, 1920s at the Royal Cemetery at Ur in southern Mesopotamia. The interest in the unearthing of lavish third millennium BCE Sumerian burials rivaled the public fascination with the 1922 discovery of the Egyptian boy king Tutankhamun's uh, tomb, and that's King Tut. The Ur Cemetery was filled with gold objects, jewelry, artworks, and musical instruments. And I tried my best um, to find what I could, um, but this website here um, still is a good um, website. Um, and here you can read about what was found. Unfortunately, the king and the queen, um, at their death, um, what did they um, find in there? They had gold helmets, they had weapons, um, they had gold beakers, um, things to drink from, and bowls. They had jewelry, they had crowns, musical instruments, chariots, chariots and actual um, human figures that would have, um, um, you know, ridden or driven those uh, chariots. Um, in other words, a retinue of musicians, servants, charioteers, and soldiers accompanied the rulers and their wives and their queens into the afterlife, giving their own lives when their rulers died. So um, here's an image of both Catherine and Leonard Woolley and it's these two Brits right over here um, who are on their hands and knees um, and they're working at the excavation site. I'm gonna see what's next. Oh my goodness. I went to pause and it told me um, that it, um, all this talking that I just did, that it was paused. So I'm hoping that starting here, and you can certainly um, push it forward um, if I'm repeating myself, um, but that you understand that um, the slide that I'm going to uh, talk from, um, I'm looking at this panel here, and please read this in here, especially um, this paragraph here, because we're looking at hybrid animals um, here that are acting in a human way, a scorpion standing um, like, like a man. And um, you have um, what appears to be um, possibly a, a goat, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here. But you have animals here that are playing a leer um, and acting in a human way, standing in a human way. So this is inlay, um, this panel here. Uh, different stone than what you're going to see. This is this is um, similar to figure 215. Do look in the book because um, you can see it in color. It is a beautiful um, instrument. Um, and um, I'm um, introducing something that is not in the book and talking about the Royal Cemetery at, at Ur. I'm surprised that what I'm about to um, show you is not in the book. Um, if you want to um, look at images of the Royal Cemetery at Ur, and this is where Queen Puabi, um, and also her husband um, eventually um, were buried. And in this paragraph here, it tells you all that was found and just an abundance of gold um, objects, um, but also this very, very, very deep cemetery and I, um, you'll read in there 
um, it, there'll be um, images of the different rooms and how many bodies were found in each room and um, who, who are the who are the queen and the king? Um, if you hear something, that's that's just my phone. Um, and what was I going to say? The queen and the king and um, all of this, they were able to identify. This website is still a good um, site. I'm sorry for the interruption. Even that is too loud. Okay, so do check it out. And here is, um, this is Leonard Woolley and Catherine, these two Brits on their hands and knees that are working in this very deep hole. Um, and the, this has to do with the royal standard of Ur. And a standard, I'm not quite sure if it's being used this way at the time, if, if this was uh, um, the Roman Empire, and we're talking about their military. Um, and, excuse me, um, and a standard is being carried into a battle. Um, we could equate it with um, carrying the American flag, um, if um, you know, if soldiers do that um, still um, in, into battle. I, I'm not sure that they do um, anymore. But in any case, it, it's a visible sign of who the approaching army is or the enemy is. But this is inlaid. Let me show you um, a close-up here. Um, this is lapis lazuli, it's rock, it's stone, um, and it's cut into small pieces and some very accurate cutting has to be done um, to create um, this uh, narrative. So um, these are larger pieces um, which are then um, drawn upon, painted upon, um, and this explains here, um, uh, this is a war chariot, love it, um, weapons in here, here's the driver, and here is the, this gentleman back here, this soldier is hanging off of um, a shallow platform here. These are wooden wheels, um, and of course, they're echoed on the other side, so uh, this is, it ha there's an axle um, between them. And there's two sides. There's the war side here, um, chariots, um, asses, soldiers. Um, these are the soldiers um, here that are driving these chariots, enemy um, soldiers um, here that are being trampled on. Um, next register is to be read from the left to the right, um, Sumerian army with uh, prisoners. These prisoners are brought up to the ruler. Notice how tall he is. This could be a standard here that he is um, holding right here or some kind of weapon. And um, what will be the demise of these um, enemy soldiers, I can't report on. Um, and um, this is the peace side where they party. And um, as you can imagine, party goods are being carried um, up to the main floor here. But um, again, one register, two register, three register. Um, and this is read from left to right, left to right, still stay right and um, come into the room where the ruler is. Again, hierarchical scale. He's the tallest. This will occur um, again, um, this idea of hierarchical scale. And these seated here are um, people that work. They could be priests or people that work under them. But we have this wonderful figure with the leer. Ah, I have a close up of that. Fabulous. Okay, so um, here is uh, this last slide, enjoy it. Um, notice that it's 20 inches high. Notice that the um, cemetery is called the Great Death Pit, and we are in Ur. Um, so this is wood, and it's covered with gold and lapis lazuli um, to recreate the features um, of this goat, and this being the thicket here. And, um, and it's standing on this fabulous box, but also notice um, goats don't act like this. Um, so it's a combination, it's a hybrid figure um, that is acting um, like a human. As far as that standard, notice that it's right over here on the floor. 
So um, the next section is about a cod. And um, I'm looking at the cod right here. And um, here we're going to start talking about kings, although I did talk about a king and queen um, buried in that cemetery. So um, the Akkadians will take over southern um, Mesopotamia. Um, in another text, uh, textbook, it talks about how, yes, they, they overthrow them, but they do keep their language as far as um, um, uh, like their written language. Um, the Sumerians will have to learn Akkadian. And um, it's interesting, um, so this area here will develop different dialects. And with all the overthrowing that goes on and what happens for the Akkadians, I mean, we see Akkad here, um, but it's quite large. The next one will be the Babylonians, um, which double in size. Um, as far as the Akkadians, um, but it, it seems like nobody um, holds on um, for too long. So um, here's this image, um, head of an Akkadian ruler, wicked famous um, sculpture. And it's uh, made out of um, bronze. And I don't believe that it is tin and copper, um, but uh, regardless, we are looking at an image um, of a ruler. Yes, his eyes are gouged out. And so that needs to be spoken to. It's, and probably um, because it's so specific um, about how it is um, um, gouged out that it, it was found and um, therefore, um, uh, uh, it, let's just assume that it was an Akkadian ruler and then, you know, it was taken and, um, it's, its ruin is a way of diminishing the power of who it may have represented. The important thing that's um, happening at this time, um, because this is a, a large takeover, so we're not dealing with just um, a city-state, which by this time, um, this is dated to, what is this one? This is 2300. Um, BCE, um, but it, it represents a time now where um, the city-states are um, support, uh, subordinate to a larger political en entity, namely an empire. And um, Akkadian became the dominant um, language. So um, what we are looking at, um, the, the um, it says in the, in the text, and all, all textbooks say it, that there were precious um, stones that were used for the eyes. And it might, um, you know, maybe sometime you will actually see something similar. Um, number one, um, an image such as this dedicated um, to bronze because it's a complicated um, technique um, to create um, an image like this. It's hollow. And um, the hollow cast system is, um, um, I, I'm not going to uh, play it for you because that it will make um, this um, PowerPoint lecture much too long, um, but I will upload it into uh, the modules uh, for you so that you can take a look at it. In any case, um, that this style, um, here we're looking at something, I mean, I see a symmetrical image of this figure, and it is um, a layering of different patterns. He's wearing some kind of a cap, I'm sure, that um, denotes his, his uh, role um, as a ruler. We have this band here underneath. Um, this looks to be um, hair. Um, and we have just uh, um, these two little lines here um, that are, are used there for the forehead and uh, coming down into this pattern um, for the beard. And then from the side, um, where it stops, where it begins and ends, and um, this um, back here, you see some curls hanging down, but this, this um, um, what's being worn, on the head and um, also involves this bun um, that his hair is has been formed to I try I have a hard time it, this is a man um, so in any case um, his hair is configured in a bun so his headdress 
is configured to accommodate um, that hairstyle. But um, from the side, um, it is a remarkable image. It, it's idealized, I'm, I'm, I believe. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful image of a man. And it's a commanding image as well um, of a ruler. So I show you this one. Um, this is the head of a ruler um, and Akkadian question mark, but I wanted to show it to you. This is a made with arsenical copper and it, um, it's almost solid cast with a dowel hole at the base that it would have been, would have been plopped on. 13 and a half inches high. And it says that arsenical means it results in a stronger final product and better casting um, behavior. So um, I just uh, threw that in there. Um, but it's, it's similar, right? It's, it's like the figure is looking um, straight ahead. Um, a, a bit different nose here um, as well. But again, pattern um, for either um, this figure does have, have a hat on, um, same idea here with um, with the beer. This is interesting here. Would love to have seen it um, in its complete form, but the ears are visible. And here um, they are, well, they've been cut off. Um, this one has been cut off here as well. Notice ears and eyes. So um, I don't know that there were any jewels in the ear, but um, that's, that's, it, it's like take the sight away, take, um, take one's hearing away, is, is um, um, can typify defacing um, the actual power and rule um, of a ruler or leader. So um, this is my last narrative. Um, for this um, PowerPoint lecture, and we'll um, do the second half in another um, lecture. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is Naram Sin. Um, not that it's, you know, an especially peaceful image, but it's just, it's just clever. And um, here's a word that you need to know because it's the stele of Naram Sin. And the stele is a stone slab placed vertically um, and decorated with inscriptions or reliefs, used as a grave marker or a commemorative monument, which I believe um, this image is being the latter, a commemorative monument. And this is figure 2-17. It's made of pink sandstone. Notice the date. Um, so Naram Sin is the grandson um, of, of Akkad. Hold on. All right. Um, my slip. Um, this is um, Sargon, <clears throat> or the grandson of Sargon. And that image there um, could be Sargon the first. And if they ever figured that one out, I don't think it will matter um, that much um, to me. But what does matter is Naram Sin was Sargon the first. Um, the king of Akkad, um, or Sargon, what's an Akkadian king. In any case, um, this is um, Naram Sin. But he is um, idealized here himself. And let me just check what I have in here. As far as the stone itself, this being sandstone, it, it's not, um, you know, it's, it, it's gone through um, some rough times. Um, it was whatever its shape. Let's let's assume it it could have been um, rectangular here, but the main features um, still remain. Um, this is Naram Sin um, uh, here, and um, he's the tallest figure. Um, these are his armies uh, that travel on uh, you know along this diagonal trail and up this way and turning around. Or what we see um, are just these. Um, these approaches along um, these <laughs> these paths along that are shaped in a diagonal line. Now um, he wears um, the horns of a divinity, and this is a mountain. We are to understand this is a mountain. In another textbook, um, someone might say this is 
an unusual um, narrative here because we have landscape elements. We've got this tree here. And if you can um, pick through um, what looks to be, um, you know, um, what it's in rough condition here, you can actually um, see the path along the mountain here. Um, but mostly what you um, see are, are the dead. So um, Naramsin is victorious in this battle. And let's take a look at this one. This is from um, a different, um, you know, different PowerPoint and it stands out a little better here. But, um, and we have this one in here, which is um, um, possibly more, um, realistic. What, what we have here um, for a first time, he has um, uh, pronounced himself as a god. Um, but notice the figure here, and I hope you can't see this thing bouncing around because it's driving me crazy, um, that's slipping down here. He's bare chested. Um, um, he has on um, the clothes probably of a leader. Notice that his, from the waist up, he is facing us. So um, his legs, this part of his body is in profile, but from the waist up, he is um, facing us um, face on, but um, he is turned, the head is turned um, in profile. He's carrying um, weaponry here. Um, let's, I wanna get this to uh, check. All right. Uh, Laurie Adams is, um, she really breaks this down better than anyone um, I've ever read in any of these uh, survey textbooks. Um, starting with Naram Sin, the fact that he's um, exposing his right side is uh, actually um, sim symbolic or, or has um, symbolism. It's um, displaying his uh, image of physical perfection. That was a sign of his inherent goodness or rightness um, as a ruler. And this will be repeated over and over. I mean, we could, um, we could go back to um, that image, um, uh, possibly Sargon the first that we were looking at, the bronze one, and just the face alone. It's, uh, you know, symmetrical. It's perfectly done. Um, and um, these, it, they, in my opinion, they are capable of doing um, sculpture, um, like a freestanding um, sculpture. They certainly understand the physiognomy um, of, of whether it's a face or the actual figure. So he is declaring himself as a divine person. Um, also, a, a convention that I think we take for granted is that everybody's headed up. Um, the mountain and heading up the mountain. I got to take this call. Life goes on. Okay, um, this idea of, of um, what we're looking at, everybody's headed up, symbolizes success. Um, those that are falling down um, are either dead um, or the defeated. Um, what we can see here is this figure here is begging for mercy. And this figure is looks to be pulling um, this sword um, from its neck. If you notice here, there is a figure that is falling um, off of the mountain here. And um, there is um, someone um, here as well that seems to be un under um, Naramsen's uh, foot um, as well. And you can see that the soldiers are all looking up. At the very top, let's just see here. Um, I want up here. Um, these are, are gods. Um, these are uh, celestial um, um, symbols up here as, um, as well. And so um, they actually represent, let's just say, the zone where the gods um, would be. And um, one could say the gods are looking down in favor of Naram Sin and his, um, his defeat of the Lulubians is are the actual people um, that he has defeated. So um, I think Adams also um, describes the fact that this is combined with landscape um, elements is, is something else um, that is uh, favorable or looked upon or um, enjoyed in, as far as images um, that are created in stone. Let's see, is there, 
something else um, that needs to be, I, I think about what he has. That cap is horned, um, all right? So you've got the power. Um, I see these as, um, it could be a, a bull, um, the horns on there. But it, the, the cap itself with horns um, it is one that a god would wear. And um, his straight back, fearless stance, um, impotency as a man and a ruler, apparently he's wearing some kind of a necklace here um, with a protective bead. Um, and so the, the stars um, shine prominently over Nerum Sin. Um, so uh, I think the most unusual thing here, um, because we're seeing it for the first time, is you have a ruler um, who um, has crowned himself um, as a divine um, person. And there's this image here, and then here is a close-up here, and you can see all the trappings. Um, um, he's what he ha is wearing, what he is um, carrying um, as well. And um, we have a good close-up. This is a really um, a good carving um, of a figure. This is relief sculpture. And if anyone is done um, in the highest relief, it would be he. Um, as opposed to his soldiers. So we move on to um, Gudea, is the Neo Sumerian um, culture. And that will be where I will start with the next lecture. <laughs>